Well, as we are uh, approaching Easter and the celebration of uh, the resurrection, I, I tend to like to preach in series coming up to a, a holiday season. Uh, I, I tend to, and, and even throughout the rest of the year, I tend to like to preach in a series. And so I've been, you know, okay, what's, what's the series uh, for this Easter? And honestly, there isn't one. But I have been uh, praying, Lord, okay, what do you want me to preach? What, what is it you want me focusing on? And as I prayed about the progression of the, uh, the sermons over the next couple of weeks, um, the Lord brought to mind a a particular verse found in Luke chapter 9, and uh, that's where we're going to start out this morning, in Luke chapter 9. Uh, now, the ninth chapter of the Gospel of Luke is a big chapter uh, in, in two ways. First of all, it's got 62 verses in it, which is quite a bit longer than the average chapter in, in most of the, the Gospels or the letters, uh, but also there are some really big events that take place in the ninth chapter of Luke's gospel. There are some very profound things that are said, uh, and, and that's the case this morning. We're going to look in the latter, chap, latter portion of that chapter. Uh, as we get into uh, Luke 9.51, we enter into what is called the travel narrative, uh, which from that point on, Luke's gospel is giving attention to Jesus' journey to Jerusalem, where his arrest, his crucifixion, his death and resurrection take place. And over the last few weeks, we have spoken about, first of all, how are we assured of the great salvation that God offers us? How do we live in assurance of that salvation? We've also spoken last week about the intimate relationship that God created us for and desires to have with us. And as we go into this morning's message, we need to understand, we need to be reminded that the salvation and the intimate relationship that we have with God through Jesus Christ is only, po is only possible, excuse me, because of what Jesus did on the cross. When he came into Jerusalem over 2,000 years ago, the work he came into Jerusalem to do is what saves us. And it is what allows us to be reconciled to God and have the relationship that we were created to have. And so having said all that, would you please turn with me to Luke chapter 9, beginning at verse 51. It says, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Now, in the first part of this verse, what's being alluded to here when it says, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, this is looking forward, this is, this is focusing on his final days, the time coming for him to be arrested, for him to face the trial, the scourging, the crucifixion, his death, the burial and the resurrection, followed 40 days later by his ascension. And as that time approached, and Jesus knew when, when, that, when that time was and when it wasn't. You remember what he, he says to his mother in the first miracle he performed at the wedding feast in Cana? When she comes to him and, and she's looking to get him to, to do something to, to help the family that has run out of the, the wine, what does he say? Woman, my time has not yet come. He knew when his time was and when it wasn't. And he understands that now is the time. Here in Luke chapter 9, he knows that now is the time to start moving towards Jerusalem and the events that would take place there. And so... As the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, he knows it's time for him to go to Jerusalem and face all of those things. And the word here that really gripped me in the second portion of this verse, that really grabbed my mind and grabbed my heart, was the word resolutely. 
Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. You know, different versions, whether you're reading from the King James or the New King James or, or whatever, they're worded similarly. Um, in, the, in the King James, New King James, the American Standard Version, it says that he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. In the New American Standard, it says that he resolutely set his face to go to Jerusalem. The English Standard Version says he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And the NIV says he resolutely set out for Jerusalem. Resolve. Steadfastness. Those are the words that are being used to describe Jesus' decision, his choice to turn towards Jerusalem and make his way there. The words may vary a little bit, but all of these versions communicate the same thing. It was in this moment, knowing that his time had come for these events to take place, and Jesus determined, he made a deliberate decision to go to Jerusalem. One of the Messianic writings in Isaiah, chapter 50, verse 7 says, because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I have set my face like flint. And if you know how hard flint is, it is incredibly hard. He's saying, I've set my face like flint and know that I will not be put to shame. That set my face like flint means determination. I am determined. I am resolved. And I appreciate, Ken, the, the communion meditation that you brought this morning, and I love it when the Lord does this. Ken and I didn't speak at all about the topic of the message this morning. There was no coordination between us. But as you read from Luke chapter 14, was it? 18, Luke chapter 18, and it talks about Jesus saying, now is the time, and, and he, he, he's telling the disciples what's going to happen. Well, here in, in uh, Luke chapter 9, verse 22, earlier than where we picked up reading, Jesus says to the disciples, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests and teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. See, let's not be confused at all. Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen when he arrived in Jerusalem. He wasn't confused about it. He wasn't ignorant of it. He knew what faced him. And so clearly, knowing what he was going to face, knowing what he would go through, knowing what he would suffer, he still made the choice. He resolutely set out for Jerusalem. And so I would say to you this morning that it was with a righteous resolve and with a steadfast heart <clears throat> that Jesus made the choice, the decision to travel to Jerusalem. I think that ought to force us to ask, why? I mean, why would you go there? Like, if you had a crystal ball, and you knew that if you went to this particular city for a vacation this summer, and you knew that there in that city, you would be mugged, robbed, beat up, shot, killed, whatever, this tr terrible event would happen in your life, and you knew ahead of time that that was true, would you go? Would you keep your travel plans? I would guess most of us would say, no, I think I'd choose something different. But Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen, so why did he go? Well, the answer is love. He went because he loves us. He went out of love for us. 
I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. Hold your place there in Luke 9. Maybe keep a, uh, put a card in it or something, mark it. Uh, hold your place there in Luke 9. But go to Hebrews chapter 12. And as you get there, I want you to look at verse 2, Hebrews 12, 2. And we're given this exhortation by the writer of Hebrews. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who, for the joy set before him, endured the cross. Now, as you read that, would you agree with me, based on what Hebrews 12.2 says, the words that the Hebrew author is using here, would you agree with me that it was the joy set before him that was the motivation for Jesus to scorn the shame and the suffering of the cross, to choose to go through that in order to have and to possess the joy set before him that would come at the other end of that suffering. Would you agree with me that that's what that verse means? Yes? No? I don't know. Quit asking me questions. I don't want to respond. Yes, okay, there we go. Somebody had said it. No, no. okay, you don't agree? All right, get out. Uh, <laughs> so clearly the verse is saying it was for the joy set before him, the joy that would be his on the other side of the suffering of the cross. It was for that joy that he scorned the shame and endured the suffering of the cross. If that's so, then it's worthwhile asking the question, what is that joy? What is the joy set before him? Well, I've heard it said, well, it was returning to the Father. It, that it was you know, the joy of, of going back to the Father and sitting down at the right hand of the throne of God as the rest of the verse completes there but the truth is Jesus as God incarnate Jesus could have gone back to the father at any time he didn't have to go through the cross to go back to the father so what was the joy set before him it was you it was you and it was me it was possession of relationship with us. It was redeeming us from sin and death, reconciling us back to right relationship with Him so that we could have the eternal, loving, intimate relationship that we've been talking about for weeks here so that we could have that relationship with Him and live with Him through eternity. We were created for that. That's the whole reason we exist and draw breath. And it was that joy, the joy of having the love relationship with us that we were created to have. It was that joy set before him that Jesus determined it was worth the suffering and the pain and the, the humiliation of the cross it was worth going through that in order to have relationship with us. Jesus estimated us to be such a treasure that he deemed it worth enduring the suffering of the cross. Is that not an amazing, amazing grace and amazing love? And, you know, you can see that that is the Lord's disposition towards us. Take some time this week and read Luke chapter 15. Read the stories of the lost coin and the lost sheep and the lost son. And you will see God's heart toward you. 
in those parables. Furthermore, we read in Paul's words in Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 8, you see at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That's God's heart toward you. See, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the triune God, Jehovah, loves us so much and considers an eternal love relationship with each of us to be such a treasure that he is willing to have incarnated himself into human flesh. He came and he lived in poverty. He suffered rejection. He suffered a painful, humiliating death on the cross. All for the joy of rescuing us, reconciling us, and bringing us back into relationship with himself. So the cost of our salvation, being fully understood by Jesus, Jesus demonstrates a loving, righteous resolve. And he steadfastly sets his face toward Jerusalem. And he marches to his own death so that he could save us and have us in relationship with him eternally. Again, what a love. What a grace has been given to us. We've got to understand the price he paid for our salvation. And that's a free gift. There's nothing that you've done that makes you worthy of it. There's nothing you can do to make you worthy of it. You can't earn it. You can't buy it. You can't achieve it on your own. It is a grace and a salvation that is freely given and is available only through the the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And it's free. All we have to do is receive it. Allow God to give it to us. But here's something else we need to know. While the saving grace of God through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is absolutely free, discipleship, being a follower of Jesus Christ, will cost us everything. And it's so, I don't know, it it impacts me, it impacted me so much to see this next portion set against the backdrop of Jesus resolutely setting out for Jerusalem. Knowing what he would suffer, knowing what he would go through, doing it for us, we then have this portion in Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 52 that we need to look at. Because while Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem, there were some people who were claiming they were going to follow him. They were going to come with him. They were going to go through life and ministry with him. But their resolve wasn't quite what his was. In verse 57, we find the first man mentioned here. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. That's a big statement. That's a big commitment. Lord, I'll go with you anywhere. Well, in Matthew's account of this, the man addresses Jesus as teacher or rabbi, which strongly suggests to us 
he probably had in mind the kind of relationship that students had with their teachers in that day. In that relationship, the student would follow their teacher from place to place, and they would learn from their teacher as they went, but usually their teacher had one certain location where they stayed, and the student stayed with the teacher. If the teacher went on a journey and traveled somewhere else, yes, the student would follow. But they were not living a transient life. They had a place to stay. They had a home. Well, Jesus turns to this man, and I am assuming he knows what's in his heart. <coughs> Last week we looked at Jesus in Luke 7 in the home of Simon the Pharisee, and he knew what was in Simon's heart. I'm assuming Jesus is exercising the same knowledge here. He knows what's in this man's heart. And he says, Foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. What Jesus is making clear to this would-be follower is that following him was not going to be an easy, comfortable walk in the park. In fact, following Jesus was going to require his disciples to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. They would sleep outside. They would go without. They would probably be hungry from time to time. They were not going to be widely loved and accepted. They weren't going to get the red carpet rolled out for them everywhere they went. They weren't going to live in the Ritz. See, it, it was shortly before this in Luke chapter 9 that Jesus makes it clear that being his disciple means that life is going to involve suffering. Maybe even death for his sake. Jesus says in Luke 9, 23, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus lets us know very clearly that being his follower means denial of self. It means commitment to him, even commitment unto death. And I believe that Jesus' message to us today is that to be an authentic disciple, it involves rejecting our personal comfort. As disciples of Jesus, we need to realize that following him means living as aliens and strangers and foreigners in this world. Now, does that mean that God doesn't want you to have anything good in your life, that you've got to be absolutely miserable to be holy? Of course not. No. In fact, in 2 Timothy, Paul says to Timothy that God has given us everything for our enjoyment. God wants us to have good things in our life and to enjoy the life he's given us. But as a follower of Christ, that, that pleasure cannot, having that pleasure, having those joys, having those comforts, cannot take priority over a relationship with the Lord, over our commitment to Christ. The second man we encounter is in verse 59. He said to another man, now notice that it's Jesus doing the initiate, initiating here. Jesus says to this man, Follow me. We don't know anything about this guy. We don't know his name. We don't know how Jesus may have known him. We know nothing about him. Only that Jesus turns to him and says, follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Well, again, first of all, notice that Jesus is inviting this man to come follow him, to come travel and journey with him, to come be his disciple. 
And we could see in the New Testament, this isn't the first time that Jesus has offered this invitation to people. In Luke chapter 5, we read about Jesus giving this very same invitation, follow me. He says to Peter and Andrew and James and John. And what did they do? It says that they left their nets and immediately they left everything and followed him. Shortly after that in uh, Luke chapter 5, he invites Levi. We know him by Matthew, the writer of the Gospel of Matthew. He invites Levi, who was a tax collector, to come and follow him. Follow me. And Levi immediately left everything to follow Jesus. And so when he offers this man this invitation, follow me, the difference between this man and the disciples who had chosen to follow Jesus back in chapter 5 is that when the disciples were invited to follow, they immediately left everything and followed him. But this man, he doesn't do that. Instead, he says, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. That seems reasonable, right? Poor man's dad was dead. They needed to go take care of that. It seems so cruel for Jesus to say what he says next. Jesus responds and he says, let the dead bury their own dead. But you go proclaim the kingdom of God. Wow. That's hard, man. Jesus, that's cold. Poor man's father is die, has died and he just wants to go bury him. Well, no, that's, that's not really the, uh, the scenario here. And as we look a little deeper, Jesus' response seems to make a little more sense. See, Jewish custom required that a dead body would be buried within 24 hours of death. There were all kinds of things that had to happen. There were preparations of the body, the anointing, the wrapping with linens, as we see in Jesus' burial. Uh, recorded in the Gospels, there was lots of things that needed to happen. And because they were responsible, the family members were responsible, and, and this was a big deal. In fact, there was a Jewish elder who once wrote, lay out the body with due ceremony and do not neglect the burial. This was a big deal in this culture. You could not neglect the respectful, honorable uh, treatment of your loved one's body. It had to be dealt with rightly, respectfully, with the proper dignity. And so this man would have been responsible for preparing his father's body, getting the body buried within 24 hours, and then getting ceremonially cleansed because he had touched a dead body. If you touch a dead body, you were ceremonially unclean. And there were things that you had to do to be ceremonially clean. <laughs> and so all of these things would have had to take place. So if this man's father had died and was needing buried, he would not have been out and about where Jesus could have encountered him and just given this invitation to him. He wouldn't have been standing there chatting with Jesus. See, what's going on here is that this man's father had not died yet. And what he is asking of Jesus is that Jesus would wait until this man's parents died for him to become a follower. Jesus, just when my mom and dad are gone, then I'll come follow you. Okay, can you hold out that long? I want to read from... Kyle Eidelman's book, Not a Fan, and I've been kind of inspired the last couple of weeks by this book again, but I want to read an excerpt to you. This is from page 190. It says, Jesus doesn't seem to be interested in this man's excuse, but I have to tell you, his excuse seems reasonable to me. He wants to have a funeral for his father. 
Isn't Jesus being a little hard, a little too hardcore? Let this guy go bury his dad. It should be pointed out, though, that this guy's dad was likely still alive and other than a head cold or maybe a bum knee, was in perfectly good health. When the man says, let me go and bury my father, it's another way of saying, when my parents die, I will follow you. We're not sure why he was waiting for them to die. Would they not approve of their son following this unconventional and controversial rabbi? So was he saying, Jesus, I really like you and I want to follow you, but mom and dad aren't going to like that. Can you just chill? Can you just hold on until they croak and then I won't have to deal with their disapproval? Was he afraid of telling them that he wouldn't be carrying on the family business? So dad, you know, expected the son. They had expectations of what their child's life was supposed to be like. But following Jesus would mean diverging from that. Was he afraid of that? Was he waiting to receive his share of a significant inheritance? Maybe it was like, you know, if I follow this guy, dad's going to cut me off. I'm not going to get the inheritance that I would have gotten had I stayed home. So, so Jesus, if you'll just hold on and wait till it's a better time in my life, then I'll follow you. He says, whatever the reason, there was a sense in which most of us resonate with his excuse. It's not that he isn't willing. It's just not good timing. He isn't saying no. He's saying not right now. And I got to tell you, I wonder how often Jesus hears that from us in one way or another. You know, back in Luke 14, 26, Jesus says, if anyone comes to me, or I guess forward into, into Luke 14, 26, Jesus says, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, and mother, his wife and children, his brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now we know that Jesus is not commanding us to hate our family members, our loved ones. But we also know that his point is that we must love Jesus more than anything else. More than anyone else. Jesus is not willing to take second place to anything or anyone. See, Jesus wasn't refusing to let this man deal with his father's funeral. He was saying, let those who are spiritually dead take care of their own. You make following me. You make participation in my kingdom your top priority. And again, I wonder how often Jesus gets that kind of not not no, but not right now from us. Are are we putting off getting serious about our relationship with Jesus until, until I'm out of high school, until I'm graduated with college, until I've had my fun, until, you know, when I retire, then I'll get serious, Lord, about what it is you want me to do and and, and how much time and, you know, of myself you want me to give to the kingdom. I'm not saying no, it just isn't a good time right now. If you can just wait until. But when we do that, what we're really saying is that while Jesus may matter to us, the thing that we're putting Jesus off for matters more. And in that case, that thing has, in essence, become God to us. I would also say that we would do well to remember that we aren't guaranteed tomorrow. And so any sense in which we're saying, okay, yeah, when the time is right, I'll get right with God. When the time is right, I'll I'll obey what Jesus says, 
about baptism and, and entering into relationship with him. When, you know, a little later, later may never come. Read the parable of the rich fool. The third man that we encounter is in verse 61. He comes along and he says to Jesus, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Again, seems like a perfectly reasonable request. He just wants to go home and say goodbye before setting off for wherever it is that Jesus is going to travel. Problem is that the kind of goodbye that he's wanting to go say would have meant a big sending off party. They would not have let him go without a lot of ceremony and pomp. And so they, they would have had a, like a big blowout party to send him off. And so it's kind of like this guy is saying, Jesus, I'll follow you. But first, just, just let me go have one last big party with my family and friends. Let me have one one last hurrah, one last big bash, and then, then I'll, I'll focus on you and, and we'll do whatever you want to do, Jesus. And the problem with that was that even before he had set out, he was looking back. And Jesus replies to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. See, it's dangerous to look back too much there's a lot that can be lost looking back Jesus uses the illustration of plowing now I'm not much of a farmer but my dad planted a blueberry field about what eight nine years ago now ten years ago something like that and if you go look at his fields, you'll see that the rows are absolutely straight as an arrow. They're not twisting and winding all over the place. It took a lot of attention to detail to make those rows straight. And something I've noticed about farmers is they like straight rows. Their rows may follow the contour of the land, but they're all straight and equally distant from one another, right? Right? Now, if you're plowing and you're looking back over your shoulder, what's going to happen to those rows? You know, you're going to run into everything. You're going to be doing circles out there in the field. They're not going to be straight. They're not going to be what they need to be. And so Jesus is saying, if we're busy looking backwards, the work we're going to do for the kingdom is not going to be productive work. It's not going to be right. But furthermore, there's a spiritual danger for us. There is a personal and spiritual danger for us when we look back. In Genesis 19, we are given the story of Lot and his family being taken out of the city of Sodom. And if you don't know that story, I encourage you to go read it. But Sodom was a very wicked city and God was sending judgment on them. And Abraham's nephew Lot lived in that city. And they were being rescued. The angels had gone to the city of Sodom and they were bringing Lot's family out, protecting them as they brought them out. But Lot's family had been given very strict instructions not to look back. But for whatever reason, Lot's wife couldn't help herself, I guess. Maybe she was going to miss whatever it was that kept them living in this city, whatever it was that they were determined to call this place home. But she looked back, and what happened? Turned into a pillar of salt. And I always picture, like, cows or goats or something licking her, like, licking that salt pillar. <laughs> like, what happened to that pillar of salt afterwards, you know? But even more profoundly, what strikes me is the Israelites coming out of Egypt. God had worked miracle after miracle after miracle to set them free from the oppression of the Egyptians. He brings them out of Egypt with all the treasures of Egypt. He brings them across the Red Sea, walking on dry land. He provides water and food for them every day, but apparently the food got to be not to their liking. 
They were missing the variety of food that they had. And so looking back, thinking about all that they had in Egypt while they were slaves, they start saying to themselves, we should go back. We should return to Egypt because we had onions and leeks and garlic and bad breath and pots full of meat and it was great. We should go back. See, because they were focused on what they thought they had back in captivity, they were willing to walk away from the freedom that God had brought them into in order to have certain kinds of foods they liked. And when we look back, when we are focused on looking back at the worldly living that we used to be in, we are tempted to go back there. We all know it. We've all experienced it. We all know exactly what's being talked about here when we look back and we begin to you know relive the glory days or whatever is on our mind there is a temptation to return to that the very things that the Lord freed us of and brought us out of in Colossians chapter 3 verses 1 through 4 says this since then you have been raised with Christ Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died. You died to your old self. You died to that old way of life. You died to that old person. That guy's dead and gone. Leave him there. For you died. And your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. We have so much more to look forward to than we do to look back about. As we said earlier, God's gift of salvation is absolutely free. It was given through great cost. It, it, the gift is free. I was thinking about this earlier this morning. The gift itself is free. But what it cost God to be able to offer that gift to us cost everything. It cost God dying on a cross. It was the greatest price paid for anything ever. And that salvation is held out to us as a free gift. We can't earn it. We can't achieve it. It's it's freely given to us. But discipleship, real, authentic discipleship, that's going to cost us. We're going to have to make a choice. But didn't Jesus make a choice for us? See, he resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He set his face toward Jerusalem. I have set my face like flint. Will we resolve? To set our face toward heaven. To set our face toward Christ. And follow him with the same determination. And the same resolve. That he exercised when he went to the cross. And will we count the cost. And know that the joy set before us. The joy set of having eternal life with Jesus Christ is worth it. I pray so. We're going to sing an invitation.
song this morning, and as we do, if the Lord has spoken to you this morning, if the Holy Spirit is laying something on your heart, if you need prayer, whatever your need, whatever the Spirit may be leading to, we invite you to come.